It's so good to be with all of you today. Happy to uh, have this opportunity to share another portion of God's Word with you. Uh, I'd like to continue with the lesson that we had last Sunday morning on uh, the scheme of redemption as it's revealed from the beginning to the day of eternity. And we talked about the promise uh, that is given in the book of Genesis of a Savior that would come into the world, who would be uh, the seed of woman and uh, okay. the seed of woman uh, they give us a victory over the devil that is talked about in Genesis 3.15. In Genesis chapter 9 and verse 26, we looked at one who was going to come from the race of Shem, uh, the Shemites or the Semites, and uh, that is, the, again, pointing to Jesus Christ, that God would dwell in the tent of Shem, that uh, there'd be an advent of God someday, that he would come in the house of Shem. And in Genesis chapter 12, one of the passages that's often described as the hub of the Bible, you have the promises given to Abraham, and uh, the spiritual promise that was mentioned is that in his seed, his uh, through his descendant, all the families of the earth would be blessed so that not only Abraham would be blessed, but all the nations would have opportunity to be blessed through Abraham's seed. And the New Testament shows us that that is Christ. And it narrows down this promised seed to uh, the house of Judah among the 12 tribes of Israel or, or Jacob. Uh, you have the tribe of Judah that the ruler's staff would not depart from between his feet until Shiloh comes, the bringer of peace is going to come from the house of Judah. Uh, you have this promise you can see back at the time of Abraham, uh, 2,000 years before the birth of Christ to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. This promise is made about the promised seed. They went into 400 years of uh, Egyptian captivity and came back out, uh, received the law of Moses, and uh, Joshua led them into the promised land and some 300 years or so of judges that were in the land. Saul was appointed to be the first king after men's own heart. And he proved to be, uh, you know, arrogant and uh, disobedient to God. And as a result, he was removed. And then David was brought to the throne. And he's from the house of Judah. And that's where the prophet said that the uh, a uh, uh, ruling tribe would be in Judah's house. And then you have promises that are made to David. We want to concentrate on that uh, during this period of time, that David's son is going to rule forever on God's throne, on David's throne. David ruled uh, over uh, the house of God, uh, the, the house of Israel, and uh of course, that was God's position, but they rejected God. They wanted to have a king like other nations had. So God gave them an earthly king, a human being, to be king, and that was David. And, uh, Jesus Christ, of course, is going to be uh, both God and man. He's going to be from David's house. He's going to sit on David's throne, and he reigns forever. So the promise was given by Nathan. Uh, you remember that David was wanting to build the temple. He'd had all of these great victories, and he'd unified all of Israel, and uh, he had uh, defeated the Gentiles on every side, and now he wants to take the opportunity to build a permanent uh, temple rather than the tabernacle, have a temple built for God and for his honor. And uh, at first, Nathan told him, oh, do whatever's in your heart. But then he received a revelation from God to go back to David and tell him that David was not the one that was going to build the temple, but it would be his son that would build the temple. And uh, so it is declared, you know, it was good that you wanted to do it, that you wished to do it. It was in your heart. That was good, David, but it's not for you to build the temple. It's going to be one that doesn't have the blood on their hands that David had in war. It's going to be a man of peace that's going to build the temple of God. So he de uh, the Lord gives a prophecy to David's house. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are completed and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, and you will come uh, and who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish 
the throne of his kingdom forever. So King David, 650 years after that promise to Judah, it, it, you see it, uh, there's one that comes to rule in the house of David, and, or the house of Judah from Jacob, and the mm -hmm. promised seed is going to come through his lineage. Um, of course, there's uh, two ways in which this is fulfilled. There is the physical immediate descendant of David, which is Solomon. And he built a physical temple for God, and he started a, a, a line of kings that reigned over uh, Israel and then the kingdom of Judah up until the Babylonian captivity that they, they ruled, and it was you know, 400 years of rule that they had, uh, uh, in which that dynasty wasn't replaced. And so, in a sense, it starts with Solomon, but in its ultimate sense, it really speaks of Jesus Christ that's going to come. In 1 Kings 2 and verse 12, And Solomon sat on the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. In Matthew 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Matthew begins his gospel emphasizing Jesus is that promised seed of David, the promised seed of Abraham that's talked about back there in the book of Genesis. And Solomon built a great temple for God that foreshadows uh, the spiritual temple that Jesus would build, the church. Thus, all of the work that King Solomon performed in the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in things dedicated by his father David, the silver and the gold and the utensils, and he put them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. So he built a physical temple, and he built it according to the plan the Holy Spirit gave to David, and he followed that plan. And uh, David uh, had set up all the gold and silver gray amounts that were able to be used in the building of the temple. And that didn't... Uh... Okay. Uh, but, uh, of course, Jesus built the ultimate temple. He's the ultimate son of David. Uh, after seeing what uh, David did there, or Solomon did there in 1 Kings 7, in Ephesians 2 and verses 21 and 22 in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So the spiritual temple, the ultimate temple God had in mind that would be built by the Christ, the son of David, uh, is the church. It's a spiritual temple made up of spiritual people that serve God and that he dwells among. In First Timothy, or First Peter 2 and verse 5, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Uh, this house, physical uh, descent from Solomon, something that uh, should be pointed out. He, uh, it was promised to David that his seed would be established on the throne forever. A great prophecy that's in the book of Psalms is in Psalms 89 that talks about this same same idea that God is making a promise in the in the distant future. He's going to establish his throne forever. And David's and Solomon's sons uh, that followed, you know, Solomon uh, on the throne there in the land of Israel and Judah, it was promised that they would be disciplined if they sinned that they would be punished if they sinned. And we find out that uh, 10 of the tribes were taken away from the seed of David. Uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel was set up uh, under Rehoboam, and only two tribes belonged to the house of David. Then the Babylonian captivity happened because the house of David was so sinful and did so many things under Manasseh that God allowed them to be taken into Babylonian captivity. And there were Gentiles ruling over the people of Israel until the time that Jesus was born. Right? Then the true king that the prophecies were talking about came. And the house of David was rebuilt, restored in Jesus Christ. And he rules on the throne in heaven forever. So those prophecies find their ultimate fulfillment. And we're in that kingdom today. The angel Gabriel said to Mary, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, 
and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And you can see by the time the last book of the New Testament was written, the kingdom was in existence, and John was, the apostle was part of it, along with the church. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom, and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So Jesus does have a kingdom. He is ruling over it. Uh, the kingdom is uh, the reign of Christ, and uh, we're able to enjoy citizenship in it. We're told in that Psalms 89 and verses 3 and 4, I have made a covenant with my chosen, talking about David. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. And in Jesus Christ, we see that completely fulfilled. In Psalms 132 and verse 11, the Lord has sworn to David a truth from which he will not turn back. Of the fruit of your body, I will set upon your throne. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter's sermon was showing that it was necessary for the Christ to come, that he was to die, be buried, be raised from the dead. It was impossible for Hades to hold him. And uh, from David's body, from his loins, his seed, one was going to sit on his throne and sit at the right hand of God. And Jesus Christ, we all need to know assuredly, is both Lord and Christ. That was prophesied about. And there's a sign to David's house that we read about in the book of Isaiah. That from the house of David, there would come this ruler who would be born of a virgin. He'd have a miraculous birth into the world. At that time, Ahab was on the uh, Ahaz was on the throne of uh, Judah, and he was uh, wanting to make a covenant with the Assyrians to help him uh, with the Assyrians to help him against the northern kingdom of Israel and against the uh, Syrians in a war. And the prophet Isaiah came to him and told him, you know, they needed to trust the Lord, and that the Lord would give him a sign to show that he should trust in the Lord and not in these, you know, physical nations to deliver them. But these, this was just a smoking firebrand, these Assyrians. They were nothing. But Ahaz said, oh, I don't want to tempt the Lord. He, did, he wanted to do what he wanted to do. He didn't want to get a sign. And since he rejected the sign, God through Isaiah told him, well, I'll give not the sign to you, but to the house of David, to the family of David, you'll get a sign anyway. And he told him what the sign would be that a virgin would give birth to a child someday that would be the ruler. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14, then he said, Listen now, O house of David, too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you have tried the patience of my God as well. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Certainly we understand in the book of Matthew that passage is quoted. It was uh, angels uh, talking to Joseph and said, this child that's going to be born to Mary is of the Holy Spirit. So this virgin is going to give birth, and you'll name him Jesus, Savior. And he's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. So God has uh, taken on human nature to come down and save us. In Isaiah chapter 9, in verses 6 and 7, it tells further about this son that's going to be born. How, what is he going to do when he comes? For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the house of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. That was stated 750 years before the birth of Christ. It says this child is coming, born of a virgin, going to rule over the kingdom of God and the house of David. He is going to rule forever when he comes. Certainly we see that fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This kingdom that he is going to establish is going to come 
in the days of the Roman Empire. We're told in the book of Daniel that the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, this reign from heaven that's been promised all the way back there to the Eve, the seed, is going to come in the days of the Roman Empire. You had the Babylonian world kingdom that was seen in the vision as the head of gold. And then you had the Medo-Persian kingdom. Another kingdom would replace it. And it would uh, be that uh, arms of silver and breast of silver. And then the thighs and the belly would be of bronze. And that was the Greek empire that was going to replace the Medes and the Persians. And then after that would come an iron kingdom that would crush all of these other kingdoms and have the strength of iron. And that is the Roman Empire. That was the fourth world empire that arose. In the days of those kings, God was going to set up a kingdom. And its feet were made of partly of iron and partly of clay, made up of different people. So it didn't adhere together. That was its weakness. God would set up a kingdom, that kingdom of David, that would last forever. In Daniel 2 and verse 44, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, and it will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Of course, since Christ is set at the right hand of God after the ascension, he is still reigning. There have been many that have challenged his rule, have attacked the Bible, tried to destroy the church, but all of those kingdoms have fallen and the kingdom of Christ remains. We have a kingdom that cannot be shaken because our king is Jesus Christ in heaven. In Hebrews 12, 28, the Hebrew writer says, Therefore, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable sacrifice with reverence and awe. So we have a sacrifice. They had already received it there in the New Testament. Christ was reigning. The kingdom was there. And we're still in it. It's still here. Christ is still reigning. Just as the prophets foretold. Christ was to receive this kingdom at his ascension, we're told in Daniel chapter 7. He was going to go up to heaven to get the kingdom. Now that only points to one person in history, doesn't it? What person's gone up into heaven to get a kingdom? Only Jesus. I kept looking in the night vision, Daniel says, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not, not be destroyed. So he's gonna, he sees the Christ coming up in a cloud to heaven. In the book of Acts, we see it from an earthly point of view. Daniel was up in heaven and saw Christ come up in his vision. Here, the apostles are looking up and seeing Jesus leave to go get that kingdom. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Took him up to the Ancient of Days, and he received all of those things that were promised. How do we know he's up there? Well, he sent the Holy Spirit down, inspired the apostles, allowed them to do miracles, speak in other languages. He's certainly up there. Established the church. In Zechariah, there are a number of prophecies that are given about that seed and what that seed would do and what it would be like. Can you see how far you've come since last week when we looked at Genesis 3.15? He crushed the serpent. We've got great details about the life of Christ already that we've looked at. In Zechariah, you just get more and more. He's going to be rejected while he's trying to be the shepherd of the people and be the king. And he's going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. And uh, yet he's going to bring in peace and he's going to bring in forgiveness anyway. In Zechariah 9, 9, he's going to enter into Jerusalem, not on a big charger, of a, a big white horse or whatever. He's going to come in on a colt of a donkey is the way the Christ will come to Jerusalem. Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So some 400 and something years before Jesus was born, here's a prophecy about how he would come into Jerusalem, the Christ, the king. He'd be bringing salvation 
he would be humble and meek. That's the type of king he's going to be. He'll be riding on a donkey. In Matthew 21 and verses 4 and 5, now this took place, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem with Jesus on that donkey. It says that uh, what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. That's mentioned in all four Gospels. They mentioned that he fulfilled that passage and came in in just that way. He is a peaceful one that's going to cut off war between people when he comes. He'll have a peaceful kingdom. People will hammer their swords into plowshares, is what Isaiah had said. There's going to be peace among people of all different backgrounds that come into Christ's kingdom. It's a peaceful kingdom. We all love each other. We're willing to serve each other, no matter what our backgrounds are. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the bow of war will be cut off and I will speak peace to the nations and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. It's a universal kingdom that the Christ is going to have and it's going to be a message of peace that's preached to those that are near and far to bring them in to be a part of this kingdom of Christ where there is no more war between different races of people and he's going to be sold he's not going to be undervalued by the leaders of the land when he comes they'll they'll think his value is that of a slave 30 pieces of silver Zechariah 11 12 and 13 and I said to them if it is good in your sight give me my wages but if not never mind so they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. What happened to Judas's 30 pieces of silver? They bought the potter's field, didn't they? God, I want, you think about, is this the word of God? Did God write this book? He wrote this book. Nobody could know those things. That magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord exactly the things that happen the shepherd is going to be smitten here's the shepherd the king of peace that's come been waiting on him all this time and when he comes the shepherd is going to be struck awake O sword against my shepherd and against the man my associate one associated with God the son of God declares the Lord of hosts strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered and I will turn my hand against the little ones. There's going to come a time of uh, darkness when the powers of darkness really uh, have their day. They're going to strike the shepherd down. But that won't be the end of the story. In Matthew 26 and verse 31, Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. What God foretold is going to happen. It's going to happen just like he said. They're going to pierce him when he comes. They're going to look upon this son of God that they hung up there on a cross, and his side will be pierced. Zechariah 12 and verse 10, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. What happened on the day of Pentecost? People came to realize that it was the Christ they put to death on the cross, and they were pierced in their hearts, just like the prophecy said. And they realized what they had done. What must we do so we can be saved? Peter told them this way. They felt that mourning over the one they pierced there on the cross. In John 19, 37, and again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So John reminds us of that passage. A fountain for forgiveness will be opened because of the death of Christ. We sing about that fountain coming to the fountain, right? It comes from this passage in the book of Zechariah, that there'd be a fountain opened by the blood of Christ for forgiveness 
in Zechariah 13, 1, in that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for iniquity. Of course, that fountain of Jesus' blood that is able to forgive our sins, it has been opened. It all happened just like the prophet said. The kingdom was prophet, promised to David promised in Isaiah, promised in Daniel, promised there in Zechariah. We could have read a whole bunch more passages from Jeremiah and Ezekiel and other places about uh, the son of David that was going to come. And John the Baptist came along and started preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's just about here. The reign of the Christ. You better repent. He was already among them, the king. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, and saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The good news of that promised seed of David has come. That opportunity to be saved is coming. Better get, better repent and get ready. And Jesus does indeed reign. He has overcome Satan and the world, just like all of those uh, prophecies we've looked at the last two weeks. In Revelation 1, 17 and 18, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Jesus is the one that can set us free from the grave. He can set us free uh, from death itself because he's overcome death. In Revelation 12 and verses 7 through 9, the devil did everything to keep him from setting up his kingdom. He even tried to destroy the church after it was established, but he's thrown down. He's defeated. He can't, he can't stop Christ from reigning. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waged war with the devil, and the devil and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough. And there was no place longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Just like was, we started off back there in Genesis, the old devil was defeated by the work of Christ. And he's reigning at God's right hand. God never forgot his promise over all those centuries back there all the way 2000 BC when he's talking to Abraham way back before that 6,000 years ago when he was talking to Eve he never forgot that promised seed he kept working to bring him into this world and set him on his throne Peter said to the Jewish people there in the second sermon of Peter that's recorded in Acts and likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days, the days of Christ and the apostles. That's what all those prophecies were about. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Isn't it a wondrous thing? that God has made this promise and has given so much evidence, just, just barely touched on all the evidence, that Jesus is that promised king, that promised savior that we all need. Surely after God has done all of this good work, we ought to put our complete faith in him and trust the salvation that he's brought. Just look at the power there is there to understand that the word of God is true, that his words have been confirmed, that Christianity is true, that all of the things foretold have come to pass, and everything that's promised about the future ought to be believed. Well, brethren, I hope this lesson will be an encouragement to you that these are things you can use to teach other people, um, that we might be able to share these lessons with others so that they might come to believe also. This time, if you'll bow with me, we'll be dismissed to our Bible class.